Hello, my name is Daniel. This video is all about you playing Bach on the piano. And today we have the three-part invention, the Sinfonia in B minor. Welcome to the channel and welcome to this tutorial. I want to give you inspiration and share knowledge and experience to help you take your Bach playing to new levels. Today it's the Sinfonia in B minor. This one here. I'll just play the beginning. Very exciting little piece, full of life, quite quirky, quite unusual in many ways, and also quite dramatic. So I'll be talking about 20 points, and I'll be going into a moderately huge amount of detail. Incidentally, whether you play this piece or not, this video contains a lot of information and advice which can help you in playing any piece of Bach on the piano. In the description below I've listed where each of these 20 points occur in the video in case you want to see any of them again. Also in the description below you can see a link to download a free copy of the score. Now to the 20 points. The emotional journey first of all. Then dance aspects, the tempo, the articulations, the importance of rests, the dynamics and voicing, the ornamentation possibilities, rubato and pedaling, and then I'll talk about technical challenges, including practicing the piece efficiently, good hand position, which fingerings to use. I'll talk about the difficult hand crossings, how to practice ornaments, how to play evenly, how to play a controlled non-legato touch. I'll talk about freedom from tension, achieving speed, playing in time, and also there's some advice on memorization. So 20 points in total. Firstly, the emotional journey. What are the moods of this piece? What is the unique emotional journey? This should always be in your mind when you're playing. And if you think about this before you start learning, it will influence everything you do. It will stop you playing mechanically, which is never very enjoyable anyway, unless uh, you're a robot, uh, although robots don't seem to mind, but I'm assuming you're not a robot. Um, I'm assuming that you're a person. So occasionally students say, well, Bach doesn't really have much feeling, but when you get to know his musical language, you'll find it's actually the very opposite. So if you're a student, don't be like those people you've heard who just learn the notes and play mechanically and then start to think about interpretation later on. Your own response to the music will be your own. And if you understand the language of music, there will be several emotional concepts which can all be correct. I will share my own personal perspective and I will try to describe how I came to my conclusions. Of course, it's all very subtle, too subtle to describe in one sense, but I think it's good to define it to some degree. The intellect shouldn't get in the way if you feel deeply, but I believe we have to think, and I don't believe it's enough to just say, well, I, I just feel it and I don't want to think. So what do we have? We have a minor key. That doesn't necessarily mean sadness. Sometimes it can mean uh, joyful energy like... Um, for example, this. Second partita, that's the capriccio from second party. But minor keys can also mean seriousness and agitation and urgency. Now I see these things in this piece. It's like a toccata. It's got this perpetual driving rhythm and you've got 30 second notes, uh, demi-semiquavers. And you have a sense of energy and propulsion. So let's think more about this emotional journey. It really starts with a high level of intensity and you have this, it's like a, an outburst in bar three of the 30 second notes. This energy continues with the double counterpoint. In other words, the two voices swap their material and then they join together for the 30 second notes in bar 6 for even more excitement. 
Then there's a change in the mood, really. When we get to bar 9, it starts moving through major keys until we get to bar 14. So the mood is much lighter here, and the 30-second notes are really quite playful, although I do sense a certain agitation and uh, underlying tension in the mood because of the quick modulations as well. I'll just play from bar 7. Bar 14 is quite strong and the major tonalities and the quick modulations continue until the arrival of E minor at bar 20. So that's a very positive feel overall, um, although there are a lot of quick modulations which give a slightly unsettled feeling. For bar 20, sequences and modulations seem to increase the sense of agitation, and then we get back to B minor. And from here we have the greatest intensification of the emotion which we had at the start. The 30 second notes continue in perpetual motion for three whole bars, and this is the climax of the whole piece. There's a real sense of emotional struggle, and this struggle is also symbolized in the way it's conceived technically with hand crossings and so on. The 30 seconds end on this diminished fifth and they kind of crash into this dissonance. follows is three, um, actually four more intense bars and suddenly um, we have a dramatic pause on the dominant seventh. Then there are more unusual progressions and then we have a strong cadence at the end with an open B. So I'll just play this. So there's no minor chord at the end, it's just an open B. And I see this openness as a symbol of strength in this particular context. Bach did this in many different occasions. Um, another example which comes to mind is the D minor concerto, this one here. And then you have the ending. particular kind of strength in that. Let's come to the dance aspects. Bach frequently used dance forms in his music and it's important to try to identify them, to kind of look for them, as it helps us to express the correct rhythmic feel and the character. This sinfonia has a strong resemblance to an Italian jig with its triple groupings, so it's to be played in a lively manner. And in this case, this should be uh, an awareness of the third beat. The third beat is slightly emphasized throughout this piece with the melodic figure seen in bar one being on the third beat. It pro um, causes propulsion to the next bar, so there really should be a, a sense of three, one, two, and the beats shouldn't really feel equally heavy. This is a very rare time signature of 916, and Bach was the only composer who used this and it's only ever been used historically in a jig. 
Kernberger, who was a pupil of Bach and a theorist, he said this particular time signature indicates lightness of touch and a quick tempo. And it reminds me of another strange, uh, slightly weird time signature, and that's 2416. This is this piece here. <laughs> That's the G major prelude from Book One of the World Chamber Clavier. I won't talk more about this now, but it's interesting to note that the Baroque time signatures were chosen to indicate aspects of performance and give clues to the piece's character. And they weren't just mathematical descriptions of how many notes, how many of this kind of note happen to be in the bar. Let's talk about tempo. Firstly, it has to dance. The player should choose a fast enough speed, but not so fast that the 30-second notes are unclear and unintelligible. Of course, we can work on the technique um, later on, and I'll be talking about this in the video. After working technically, you'll find a speed which is comfortable for you. And in choosing that speed, it's also relevant to see how you can play the most difficult parts. What's the speed where you can manage those difficult bars and then you go back and you adjust the entire uh, speed of the piece according to that. Then you know that you can play the hand crossings without having to slow down or show a sense of difficulty. So it's better to play uh, fractionally slower and keep uh, in total control. Articulations. Articulations are very relevant in projecting the sense of dance. So to enhance the dance feel, you lighten off at the end of each beat, end of each three uh, semiquavers. So you don't want these heavy repeated notes. So it makes sense to slow the first two notes and keep the repeated notes shorter, but not very short, not like pecky staccato, but more like something like this. So you have some dancing going on with the articulation. The melodic figure, first seen in bar one, moves in conjunct motion. So I would play that more legato, but not all. I would play the first two slightly detached because I think it highlights the third beat more. However, it's a good idea to vary the way you express that melodic figure. So when it occurs later in the piece, I like to play the first two notes uh, legato as well. Of course, it's all very personal. Changing the articulation adds a subtle change to the character, and I think this extra smoothness suits the major key better in bar 17. And that also fits in with cantabile. Bach said it should be cantabile with these, these two and three part inventions. Although the term cantabile doesn't also um, doesn't simply mean legato, it can encompass many other contexts to do with the articulation as well. The 30 second notes should be played with sense of detaching, very slight non legato, and I'll talk about that later on how we can achieve that. One more thing at the end of the fermata in bar 32. Detach the right hand A sharp and the left hand E just before the start of bar 33. So you can hear this wonderful F sharp singing by itself. I'll just demonstrate that. So you hear the F sharp singing by itself, and this is it's a lovely, exciting moment of anticipation. The importance of rests. Rests are important. Well, that's, that's obvious. That's a truism. But I just want to point out some rests in the piece because they're compositionally used to create rhythmic impetus. Well, that's one function of them anyway. And that's something you'll notice when you play the harpsichord. When the note is finished and it's followed by a silence, in other words, at the onset of a rest, there's a very definite sound, which is the sound of the plectrum leaving the string. And this sound can create a certain underlying rhythmic element. So the end of the note can have a relevance to the perception of the rhythm. 
This works also on the piano to some extent. There's a few in the Walt Tempered Clavier Book 1, the E major, where there's a rest in the subject, and it has to be absolutely precise, so this quirky rhythmic effect works. This is the one here. So the crotchet, the quarter note F-sharp, has to be the exact length, so the 16th note rest can have the proper rhythmic effect. So you don't want this. You don't want that. It's really... Um, there was a little bit too long, this rest. The rest has to be precise. So the crotchet, the quarter note F-sharp, has to be the exact length. And in the Sinfonia in um, B minor, the one we're playing, we have the first left hand note, pop. So that has to be precise as well. That, that rest is very important rhythmically. Hold the dotted eighth note, the full length, every single time it occurs, and then the sixteenth note rest can give this rhythmic um, impetus that I'm talking about. Bar seven, same thing here. Pop. What's interesting is bar 33, the left hand note is actually shorter than you would think, just an eighth note, so it gives more brilliance, it's slightly shorter, it gives more brilliance and excitement to the right hand 30 second figuration, so don't hold that too long. That's another interesting point there, where you have a, a relevant rest. <laughs> It's good to look for these little details. Now we come to dynamics and voicing. As I mentioned before, Kernberger said that there is a likeness implied in this unusual time signature of 916. Well, I would definitely start on the, the quieter side, and one reason for this is the architecture of the whole piece. There's no doubt that the most intensity is found around two-thirds of the way through with these hand crossings. And there's also a definite sense of increasing intensity leading up to there. So I would keep it quieter in order not to negate that effect. I will just go through now and demonstrate my dynamics and include the subtle dynamics of the voicings uh, as well. Beginning... Piano right hand, I would make the left hand here slightly louder. I'd also phrase here that top line as well. Here with the 30 seconds, I would add some life and vitality in the middle by doing a, a subtle crescendo diminuendo through those notes. Here, when the parts swap, hear that as well, like before, and the right hand slightly louder. And as I said before, some life in the middle. Here, starts to move into the major, so I would vary the dynamics slightly with each uh, harmonic change. A bit less. A bit more for that. A bit less for that. This, this is spontaneity uh, as well, to some degree, but one has to consider the, the harmonic implications and how that affects these passing effects, in other words, passing emotions. Here, we have all of these 30 seconds with, again, some vitality. Uh, not all the same dynamic, but varying it, perhaps having more life in the middle of each. <laughs> Quiet for the 
major there. Here, project slightly. Here, a bit stronger. Again, more positive major feel. Again, I would alternate these sequences more or less, more or less, to have a sense of conversation and harmonic progression. And as you heard, really it's moving back to this minor sense of combination, sense of in growing intensity. So I would start these. The 30 seconds, these three bars from bars 26, 27, 28. Um, louder, as this is really the climax of the piece. From then on, keep it strong until the fermata in bar 32. And then again, intense and strong really up until the end. So don't lose that sense of intensity. Now we come to ornamentation. Most players customarily add some ornaments of their own, and looking at the manuscripts of Bach's pupils, I'm sure a lot more ornamentation was commonly used. It's really up to the individual's taste. I would add a trill to the A-sharp in bar 5, as you would have heard, but not in bar 2. I like to keep the, the beginning more understated. So, bar 5... <laughs> Bar two. Um, bar ten. I like to add a lower mordant. Sometimes it's, it's again very spontaneous. I don't add um, lower mordants to the previous bars, as I don't want to intensify those bars. It really depends on your emotional concept. A couple of other places are bar 18, with the left hand here, and also add a lower mordant in bar 25. Which you would have heard there. I think that really increases the intensity up to those 30 second notes. Also, after the appoggiatura, Again, a lower mordant, which I have a five-note trill. Um, five-note trill uh, on the, the second and third beats of the bar, uh, bar 32. And at the end, we have five-note trill. Or you can do three notes. even longer actually gives a sense of strength definition to that cadence at the end now let's talk about rubato rubato doesn't feature much in this piece because of the toccata like motion and also the dance elements as well it has to have a strong rhythmic drive, although it also has to breathe. I like to slow very, very slightly into the major cadence in bar 14. 
that seems a suitable thing to do, but it's very subtle. There's also a natural sense of slowing up to the fermata uh, in bar 32, which I've just been playing, and I would feel a writ through that bar, feeling a slow two, three, and I'd elongate the fermata just long enough to give a sense of anticipation and tension. The next two bars feel like a slightly freer cadenza concept after the pause. So I would start the 30 second notes a little bit slower and then a cello rondo, so you speed up and then writ at the end of bar 34. Again, subtle bits of rubato help to have a sense of excitement and spontaneity. But the overall piece is very rhythmic. So again, it has to be subtle. Next we have pedaling. This is going to be very quick. Um, uh, don't pedal. Okay, next segment. Well, actually, <laughs> I'll say a little bit more. Um, it's a fast, light piece and it demands absolute precision and clarity, so any blurring would take away from that. And pedaling the 30 second notes would really take away from the excitement, so it, it would add a kind of soften, softened effect to the brilliance. However, the overall sound shouldn't be dry and cold, there should be sufficient weight to create a good quality sound, so you don't actually need resonance from the pedal. But there shouldn't be too much weight, otherwise you'll have the wrong kind of heaviness in the articulation. So it really has to dance, but it has to have a sustained sound from the fingers. Now we'll talk about how to actually physically play the piece. We'll talk about the technical challenges, but first I'd like to talk about how to practice it efficiently. It's always best to work in small sections because then you can be the most analytical. With small sections you are addressing issues which only happened a few seconds ago which means you're more likely to remember them in more detail. The principle is to stop at the end of each section and repeat it a few times or several times until you're convinced that you've made a substantial improvement um, or, or until it's stunning and amazing and Perfect. With this particular piece I would make a new section wherever you have bars of 30 second notes. So therefore section 1 will be bars 1 and 2. You might want to write this uh, suggestion in your score. Section 2 would be bar 3. Section 3 would be bars 4 and 5. Section 4 bar 6. Section 5 would be bars 7 to 10. Section 6 bars 11 to 13, section 7 bars 14 and 15, and so on and so on. So you follow that principle. So therefore make a section out of the bars which are not 30 second notes, and when the 30 second notes come back, start a new section. Some sections will obviously need more repetition and some less. Uh, one section might be fine after three repetitions, another section you might have to repeat um, a thousand times, well, maybe ten. So, always keep the tempo very slow for some time to allow full attention to every detail and to stay relaxed. And if you don't see any improvement after repeating a few times, that means you're playing too quickly. Another point, try and combine the technical awareness with the interpretation as much as you can. And I'm about now to go into details of the technique which should help you. And when implementing each of these aspects, try to retain the sense of the interpretation to some extent. When you've achieved mastery technically, more details of the interpretation will suddenly materialise. But try to avoid playing mechanically in the early uh, learning stages. So, good hand position, just a brief comment on this. Keep the wrist slightly lower and keep it moving to avoid accidentally playing the repeated notes too heavily. 
wrist relaxation is crucial. With the 30 second notes again, make sure the rest, wrist is flexible, not too high because it helps you not to accidentally make accents. Also, this flatter hand position is important for the hand crossings later on. The left wrist moves up a little bit, but not too much. Certainly not in a, a tense way. Which fingerings to use? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is the repeated notes. Pianists often change fingers on fast repeated notes because they can play them more quickly. Uh, but they also change on slow repeated notes in order to vary the colour slightly and to stop this mechanical evenness. But it's not applicable in this piece. It's applicable in a melodic uh, kind of piece such as... That's 3-2 Goldberg variations aria. With this, it's 5-2-2, two, 3-2-2 two, three, two, two at the beginning. That seems obvious. Left hand, one, three, three, two, three, three. Don't play the repeated notes mechanically, all the same sound. They should be a bit lighter. So you can really do this. If you use the same finger on the same note, you can really control that quite easily, actually. Just be aware that when you do use the same finger on the same note, you can become mechanical. So it's important to listen for this. A good uh, addition will give you good fingerings, uh, including the advice for the 30-second notes, but experiment yourself and particularly listen for undesirable accents, as I've mentioned before. Some fingerings will predispose you to making accents you don't want and you're not aware of. So you might create some unusual syncopations. <laughs> you can see uh, my fingerings through the video on this uh, camera a keyboard camera which is there so I'll just explain the beginning here to start with um, 5 2 2 3 2 2 I've talked about already bar 3 I'll simply play that slowly as an example of my fingering on the 30 second notes 5 1 2 3 5 3 2 Four two one five four two four two one four two. So if the wrist moves and it's comfortable, that's a good fingering. For the hand crossings, I'll talk about fingering in the next section of the video. Well, you'll be able to see that actually, uh, and that's devoted especially to the difficult hand crossings. Also bar 34, I mentioned bar 34 here, you have the right hand 3-5 changing to 1 and 3. Now good advice is really to, to change immediately. Uh, don't change halfway or two thirds of the way through the bar. Much easier to change straight away. A main priority in choosing your fingerings is of course ease and comfort, so experiment to see what gives you the most control and try different options. Don't simply assume your fingering uh, is the best for you. Keep experimenting. Now we come to the difficult hand crossings. When it comes to Bach, the most difficult hand crossings that he wrote really are in the Goldberg variations. Of things like this here, this is variation 16. I'll play from halfway through. The Goldbergs were written for two manuals. Um, this symphonia was actually written for one, which is actually more difficult. And the original. So, the first thing I want to talk about in bar 26, this is the three bars of the, the 30 second notes here with the hand crosses coming up. The first thing I want to talk about is the repeated beat. Listen for that. You should be able to hear this. Don't blur this by holding the left hand thumb uh, too long. 
Bars 26 and 27 are quite straightforward. Uh, hold the dotted eighth notes long enough, but not too long because your hands have to move to the next position before playing. So it doesn't make them too short, not too long. I'll play these bars slower so you can see how my hands are positioning, in other words, moving quickly to the next position, ready to play in the next position. This is bar 26 and 27. Next we come to bar 28. It's a peculiar bar because you have the same D in both voices, but you don't want both hands to play that same note. If you do that, have you tried that? It sounds, well, you, you play an accent. It sounds like you're thumping the D. So you really want to just use one hand. And I use the right hand and leave the left hand D's out. I'll demonstrate what I do separately, and then I'll play slowly. Um, well, I'll play slowly so you can see the fingering. It's the right hand. Left hand. And together. There's a more simplified version which gets rid of the hand crossings altogether. I don't do this as I want to hear the voice in the upper stage smooth with an even tone colour all the way through and that only occurs when you use the right hand to do that. The other way is easier but the lines are less clear and it can end up sounding like churning. <laughs> but um, I know you want to see this so I'll show you. I'll play it separately and then together and I will do this twice. So it's easier, but I think it's a hindrance musically. It's good to know though, in case the hand crossings are particularly difficult. You can still make it work musically if you think about it. But as I said, I prefer playing all the top line, the top voice in bar 28 with my right, myself. Now let's talk about how to practice the ornaments. If you have a four note trill from above, like in bar 5, the fourth note would coincide with the second uh, left hand sixteenth. But don't accent. That will create a syncopation. So this is how you would normally practice it slowly and then I'll gradually speed up. Ten, as I mentioned before, and again I'll demonstrate how to practice this. You would start slowly, and the modern would end before the second right hand note. This bar nine and ten. Also, don't play the modern early. Don't play this. That's confusing and not stylistic either. Also, uh, if you want a mordant in bar 25, like I play here, you would play this, practice it slowly like so. Until it was comfortable, even slower than that. Beat. And going back a little bit actually to bar 18, this is how you would practice the 
Mordant. Uh, it's actually, no, it's a four note show from above uh, in bar 20. <laughs> So on. Now the second last bar, trill, um, there are five notes, as I said, I prefer five notes. You would practice that slowly, like so. So the A sharp and the F sharp occur before the trill because of the slowed D to C sharp. So, in other words, it's like this. The slow means you don't play the trill from D, so this is not correct. That's and there are more places that you can add ornaments as you wish. That's one of the wonderful things about interpreting Bach, is you have that freedom. Now we come to evenness, evennesses. <laughs> the parts of the piece which are most vulnerable are obviously the demi-semic crevice, the 30-second note figurations, so I'll focus on these. Two kinds of evenness, rhythmic and tonal. So firstly, rhythmic evenness, bar three, Every note should be the same speed. So when you're first learning, keep everything very slow all the time. And when you play any of the bars with 30 seconds, play these bars even slower. So find a slow speed firstly where it can be perfectly even. Keep trying. Change your speed until it's even. And then when you get to the 30 second bars, slow even more. For example... a trill there. Why did I do that? Well, spontaneity. I won't do that, actually. So you're deliberately playing these slowly. So you're thinking of every note being the same speed, and also think of the beats. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four. But don't accent the first notes of each. Just feel them. That helps for evenness as well. Also, simply describe to yourself where you heard the unevenness. For example, in bar 6, if I was to play this now, uh, let me demonstrate. I'll play the left hand by itself and I'll play it unevenly and then I'll talk about it. Was that audible? I did that a little bit. Rush between four and two. And I also rushed between five one. So be careful with five and one. That's slightly more difficult. So just tell yourself. Um, try and analyze. Think about precisely where they are uneven and repeat until it's perfect. When playing hands together, listen to ensure that they are actually exactly together. If they're both even, they will sound together. So I'll give you an example. Again, we've got bar six. I'll play it slowly, and I will deliberately uh, lack synchronization, and I'll tell you what happened. Well, I don't need to tell you, but... That's one place where that could come apart, but listen very carefully. That's the ending as well, because you're going up, you're going up in the right hand an octave higher, so you could be not together there. Just listen for togetherness. Now to tonal evenness. So each note has to have a control volume, so there aren't any strange accents and strange places. That's not desirable. So, also, some notes can drop out that can be actually too quiet, so you have to pay attention to that as well. Now, I'll revisit uh, bar 25, the most difficult bar. 
and I'll play it slowly and I'll play it tonally unevenly and talk about what was wrong uh, to explain what uh, the appropriate approach to practicing. So, accenting the thumbs a little bit, which is a, a definite tendency. So be aware of that. That was slightly too, slightly too loud there. I think that sounded okay. So on. But you need to repeat, 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 and just listen for notes standing out or notes dropping out. Now I'd like to talk about how to play a controlled non-legato. Now why do I emphasize controlled? What can be uncontrolled about non-legato? Well, there are actually tiny gaps between each note, very, very small gaps. And these tiny gaps can be different lengths, which can sound unrefined and lacking in control. So what's the approach uh, to ensure a correct non-legato? I'm talking again about the 30-second note passages. Firstly, listen to those little gaps. If some are missing, in other words, if you're slurring those together inadvertently, that's not good. And also listen to, to, to make sure that some notes are not too short. So you're listening particularly for that. Another very helpful piece of information, potentially, is... And, and this is fundamental to my playing, actually. It's thinking of the articulation as lif lifting your fingers up out of the keys rather than moving them down, which sounds strange. But the way you're actually thinking is more up, 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 rather than the down, down, down movement. And this uh, is very useful indeed in playing an even non-legato. So let me demonstrate bars 11 to 13 this time. How tiny are these gaps? Well, they're very small indeed. <laughs> so you have to experiment and think to yourself, is this the correct length or are the gaps too large? Let me demonstrate gaps which are too large. Sounds, well, at a slower speed, sounds detached. <laughs> When it's sped up, the gaps become smaller. But they're still there. You can also play two legato, just as an experiment. So there's no gaps at all. So you simply experiment, try again, until you can hear these tiny little gaps. And that's, that's really a correct... Uh, way of playing non legato achieves a real excitement to the sound and adds clarity and control. Next, I'd like to talk about freedom from tension. Now, freedom from inappropriate tension is an absolutely crucial element and technique. It influences everything. Freedom is not just essential to prevent tightness in the, the wrists and arms and so on, but it's the only way to play with full control, technically and musically, too. So, do this. Firstly, uh, before you begin, <laughs> like I like doing that, um, remember to keep the speed very slow and also quieter when you're first learning. Focus on the sense of freedom as you play. Can you feel your wrists and arms move? If they're moving, they're really relaxed. So then you apply what you've felt and experienced in the slow practice to the faster practice, gradually faster, gradually faster, retaining that feel. And in the 30 second note passages, if I revisit them again, really it's good to add a little bit of wrist movement to that, a conscious up and down movement, just a tiny little bit. So if I can demonstrate that, think of also the evenness of course and the non legato as well. There's so much to think about with these passages, but all this information should be able to be synchronized and put together. So I'll just show you a little bit of this in terms of the up and down movement 
that I encourage you to incorporate in the slow practice. As you play quicker, that will diminish, but the feel should remain, and the freedom should remain. Achieving speed. Now maybe you'd like to play this a little bit faster, or maybe a lot faster, or maybe you'd like to play it um, ridiculously fast. <laughs> so greater speed will naturally occur when you have achieved the right kind of non-legato, and a greater sense of technical ease and relaxation. There's these things that I've mentioned before. So the speed will happen when you're practicing in sections and you're ready to speed it up. Always start slightly slower every time and then repeat several times each time very slightly quicker. So you relax a little bit between each repetition. Here I'm doing this again. You should do this as long as nobody's watching you, it's fine. Uh, although you're watching me. Um, yes, so it's always a good idea to relax between each repetition. You're not incessantly keeping on going and going. And mentally, that um, cause, causes tension as well as physically. Try to push your speed limit. When the playing falls apart, go back to playing a little bit slower again. And in the practice session, you should be able to exceed your previous speed from the previous days. But again, just be very careful how much you speed up and a little bit at a time. So let's talk about playing in time. You could be speeding up or slowing down unconsciously. You know, in the 30 second bars, you could be slowing down, which is obvious, I suppose, because they're difficult. You could be uh, finding it a bit laborious. Or you could be rushing. Now that's actually quite common in these bars when you hear people play this because there's tension which comes in, I think. And also um, with that comes an absence of concentration on the overall beat. So you have to make sure that the 30 second notes are not rushed. So no matter where you are in your preparation, you should check your rhythmic precision by using the metronome, sorry, <laughs> you should um, use this, uh, I, although I apologise for saying that because uh, I'm, it's, it's a bit of a, an irritating mechanical beast. <laughs> but it can be useful. I have an app on my phone so you can turn it down. It's up to you how often you use it, but put it on occasionally just to check to see that you're flowing through really in a consistent speed. You're not doing anything that you're not aware of doing. Okay, finally, we have point 20. Advice on memorization. Now, if you're used to playing from memory, that's great. It will be uh, an advantage in this piece. If you don't usually play from memory, I strongly suggest that you memorize the most difficult bars for you, the bars with the 30 second notes, for example. And that will free you from having to look up and down, which is very disconcerting, especially in a concert. You can really see your fingers moving correctly when you're looking at them. So I suggest you memorize that for, for even the technical fluency from that point of view alone. So you would be looking down, let's say if you take this uh, suggestion of mine, you'd be looking down just before the bar of 30 seconds at the right time. So try and be consistent in your practicing so you're looking up and down not at random places. Again, when it comes to the performance, I mean, if you decide to perform it, you don't want to be looking up and down the page and thinking, where, where am I? Because you're not used to looking up and down in the same way. So memorize the most difficult bars for you or the whole thing. Not particularly challenging with the memory of these bars, um, 30 seconds and so on. They're broken chord figurations, so you should say to yourself, what is the harmony here? and you could maybe write the harmonies on the page. So in order to memorize, you repeat sections slowly, several times, until you feel you can try for memory, and then when you repeat, um, you simply remind yourself what you didn't get, and so on, and you go back, look for patterns. A lot of other things to talk about with Bach memorization, and I'd like to do that in another video. 
You can also um, sing to try and get the oral perspective, although we're trying to memorize um, the fast the fast bars, I suppose it's not not a la 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 no it's not singable. <laughs> so don't say that, sorry about that. No, um, just use your oral skills. Singing along actually, as long as nobody's listening, that's actually very helpful. So I hope this video has been interesting and helpful and valuable and stimulating. If so, please subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell, share the video with your friends and with anyone you know who loves playing Bach on the piano or anyone who loves playing Bach on anything or anyone who just loves Bach. Please give me a thumbs up. I would appreciate that. Any comments or queries, please let me know in the comments section below. So what did you find most helpful for you? Do you have any suggestions for future videos? Anyway, it would be very good to hear from you. So thanks so much for watching and I will see you next time.